This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. <laughs> the talk. I am Shekhar Gupta and my guest this week is the tree woman of Africa. Actually, the tree woman of the world, Nobel laureate Bangari Mathai. Thank you. On her first visit to India. Thank you very Welcome much. Welcome to Walk the Talk. How wonderful to have you. Thank you. It's show. great to be here. You, you like being in Delhi. We tried to find a, a wooded area for you uh, as much as we can find one in Delhi. Well, Delhi is absolutely fantastic. I want to commend the leadership in Delhi because I haven't seen a more green city in the world. Oh, well, I mean, uh, you've come here, you may have also seen that uh, there are strong environmental groups here. And, and also it's a city that's going through uh, massive infrastructure building, so there are always challenges of, of balancing this. Yes, this is always uh, something that is very difficult for people who are in charge of management and development, because you always have to make a choice. And I know that sometimes you have to cut trees, sometimes you have to, to take over land for development, but uh, it's always a matter of um, making the right choices and finding a balance. Yeah, right. And uh, you're not a fundamentalist on this issue. You, you don't say don't cut any trees. Well, you can't say that because uh, definitely some trees have sometimes to go. They also die because they are living. So it's not as if you, you cannot sit on a desk or, or use wood. Uh, but as I say, it's a matter of, uh, of balance. balance. Uh, and many people don't have that sense of balance. And that's right. where we have a problem. Or, or maybe sensitivity. Yeah, maybe sensitivity. Uh, but there are people, for example, I notice uh, in my own country, I have a problem with uh, uh, people who lay down electricity wires. Right. That everything has to make way for the, for, the, for the wires. And it should be possible sometimes to divert the wires yeah. and make a corner to allow a tree to or, survive. Or maybe put higher pylons for, for wires to go And higher. there is nothing wrong with uh, having trees along the path along the walk, very close to the road. Right. I'm sorry to start this on from, with a local issue. The whole question of compensatory plantation. You know, if you cut a tree here, can you plant more elsewhere and compensate? Does it work? Well, I think that it, what is important is that we must realize that uh, we need a certain amount of trees on our land. In right. fact, the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, recommends at least 10% of our Lad mass should be covered by right. vegetation, especially right. trees. So um, it is a matter of you cut here, you replace. It's very, very important for us to get into that mindset and that uh, culture, if you please, uh, to make sure that we always have trees and vegetation covering the land. Because not only do you need the vegetation to, for fodder, for, for firewood, for building, but you also need it to protect your soil. Right. And worldwide, we are losing masses of topsoil into the seas, and that's very tragic. And so, so if, if, if this tree has to be cut because the highway has to come up here, can you compensate this by planting a number of trees elsewhere? I'm sure you, you, we should be able to do that. I, I hope that that is done. And I also want to say that, um, as I say, it's a matter of balance, because I know, for example, here in Delhi, they are considering cutting some trees so that they can... Uh, concentrate on public transport right. to reduce the number of trees individuals use because if you have a lot of cars on the road you are also producing greenhouse gases and right. we are worried about the climate change right. so, no, so where do you find the balance do you find the balance by reducing the number of cars and putting in buses so that you can transport more people with less pollution and right. if you do that a few trees unfortunately may have to go. You know, you talk so much like a scientist. Uh, reading about you, I realize you got your PhD in biological sciences. That's right, yeah. Actually, uh, studying how some parts of the yeah, I some started plants, the, the brain yeah. work and some... I, I started with uh, studying the pineal body, which uh, those of uh, doctors know, it's a very small uh, uh, gland in the brain. In the brain. The, and I was looking at it in birds, because in human beings it's... Uh, it's really a dormant tissue, we right. think, relatively. But in birds, it's very active. So my professor wanted to know what's the role it plays in, um, 
in the brain or in the birds. And so, um, yeah, that was and, uh, my and, master's program. And, and, and you, you became the first woman to acquire a science PhD in your region, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, I was very lucky. And when people ask me, how did you get to this point? I say, well, I was lucky in many ways because I had my mother, and especially my mother rather than my father, were sent me to school. My father wasn't at home, but my mother wasn't thinking of sending me to school until my brother, my older brother, asked uh, my mother why I wasn't going to school with them. And bless her heart, um, she said, there is no reason why. So I went to school at a time when girls were not going to school. Right. And that was really um, a great opening for me. And I told that story uh, proudly, but also partly to challenge parents and to, to make parents realize that the decisions we make for our children, when they are too young to make decisions, can make a difference in their lives. And that it is upon us, we have a moral responsibility to guide our children. Well, well some people would say your mother, my mother made you too independent. <laughs> I, I, I think you're... <laughs> she probably did, actually. <laughs> I think your, your former husband said that. As a charge in a court, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think that sometimes he gets more uh, uh, flapping that he deserves. Uh, but I, I think that uh, my mother sent me to school and then sent me to um, missionary schools. Right. And in those missionary schools, there were some very positive aspects of, of the missionary schools, some not so positive. But the positive ones were the encouragement to be free, to, to think freely, to be independent. And also I think my going to America made a lot of difference because that was even more uh, freer than back home and I was right. in America at a time of uh, great turmoil when um, the civil uh, society in America was, was fighting. Yes. They were revolting, they were trying to say uh, the human rights issues right. in America especially for the black people was right. very poor. So my experiences actually gave me the independence but I didn't realize that I was acquiring an attitude, a mindset, that would become a problem for me. It did? <laughs> it did become a problem. When I went back home and I, I wanted to teach in the university, I found the discrimination in the university against women. I tried to fight that. And then, of course, when I became um, uh, a wife and I was trying to push a career, I found that it was difficult. Women were not expected to be career women. They were expected to be housewives. And yet I had um, the qualifications that were actually needed by the country. So trying to combine the two of them uh, eventually put me in a little bit of trouble. So, so to tell us that wonderful story of how did extra A got <laughs> a added to your second name? <laughs> Mathai became Mathai. M A A T H A. Yeah. Well, it's a long story, but to cut it short, um, as you, when you have read the book uh, that I recently released, Unbowed, right. you, you will see that uh, I had a problem with my husband. My husband was uh, uh, trying to get rid of me and I was trying to hang on, kind of. And when he finally got a divorce, I was very disappointed because I felt that the judge was either corrupt or incompetent. And I told him as much. And then, of course, he threw me into jail for that for, for contempt, six months, yes. for contempt of court. Yes. But um, in the process, then my husband wanted me to drop his name. Now, in our traditional uh, marriage systems, girls never dropped their, their father's names. But when we adopted, as we were adopting the English method, I had become Mrs. My Husband. Right. And I had adopted his name. But now that we were divorced, he wanted me to drop uh, his name and I really was having a problem about identity and I said I can't be a person who is today this and tomorrow that um, This is this is a little bit too dehumanizing for a woman and so I decided uh, I would add a name so that it wasn't his, his name, name anymore <laughs> It was my name. So you got around the judge certainly. That's right yeah.